Hello everyone, this is uh, Stephen Ball here, and joining me on the line today is Roy Wild. Hi Roy. Hello. Hey, how are you doing? Yeah, good, thank you. So, um, the webinar today, we're going to be running through it. It's about 20 minutes, and um, we'll have some Q&A at the end as well. Um, if you have any questions as we go through, um, both Roy and myself are online, so please feel free to pop your questions in the GoToWebinar chat panel as we go through. And um, if there's anything we need to cover off at the end, we'll be covering those through the, the live Q&A at the end as well. So. Um, Sit, sit back, enjoy, and um, we'll chat to you soon. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Roy Wall. I'm the president of Wall to Wall Software. And today I'm excited to show you a new product that is just about to be released. The name of the product is called Beam, and that stands for Beacon Fence Externally Advanced Mapper. Before going into Beam, I'd like to talk a little bit about Beacon Fence technology and the map designer that's currently in the IDE. This map designer is implemented when you double click on the Beacon Fence component from within Delphi. And once you get into this program, you can define zones and paths and beacons. For zones, the mapping editor allows you to define rectangular, circular, or polygonal regions. And what are these zones for? These zones are going to be data for your application so that it will be able to know when the users enter these zones and you can get an event notified within Delphi and take some action. But the mapping editor doesn't really do that kind of logic. The mapping editor is, is for the raw data so that your application can actually use it. It also allows you to define paths and path nodes. And this is useful information for again for your application so that it will have information about when a user is near a path and you might be able to display some information to the user based on him passing that location. And finally it lets you define where the beacons are going to be placed and this is useful for the again for the beacon fence to determine the user's location and support that they're accurately defined and their location is accurately defined as well. So you need good design tools in order to accomplish that. So there are some limitations of this approach for beacon fence being inside the IDE only. Number one uh, the map must be edited in RAD Studio. So the person who wants to define the map must own RAD Studio. And number two, the programmer may not be available at the mapping site. So the mapping site could be some location where the programmer doesn't work at and doesn't want to have to go there and measure things and enter the data. Your company may also want to use a non-programmer to enter the mapping data. So it doesn't really require any special programming skills to define the data for the map and define the regions define the beacons and, and the node locations and the information about them. Thirdly, the beacon fence editor is not touch enabled. This means if you have a service book or another touch enabled device, it will not recognize any hand gestures or touches to the screen to zoom in on things or to move maps around or objects around. Ideally, it would be very nice to have like an iPad or an Android tablet or even your phone and take that to the site and be able to enter the mapping data right there and have it be easy and touch enabled so that it's natural to enter the data. And finally, BeaconFence is currently Windows only and Beam addresses that. So this brings us to the product Beam, which stands for Beacon Fences Externally Advanced Mapper. Wall to wall, we've created an external map editor which creates XML mapping files which are directly importable into the IDE or you can load them at runtime with your code in your application with a method call. And Beam is written entirely with the FireMonkey library. So the end result is that the executable will run on Windows, iOS, Android, and OS X. And it supports all the existing capabilities of the Beacon Fences internal editor. So this brings us to one of the exciting features of Beam. It's touch screen enabled, so you'll be able to drag and drop, you'll be able to zoom, you have to resize all with your fingers and you won't have to use a keyboard to select objects or to select multiple objects for that matter. And it does have mobile app sharing service enabled for sending to email, Google Drive. So if you, after you finish your editing your map, you want to send an email, you can do that or you can save it to your Google Drive or OneDrive and Dropbox. And it has a max layout mode, which means the map will be maximized in size for smaller devices so that you'll be able to even use an iPhone and actually get constructive work done in designing your map. There are some additional usability enhancements provided with Beam. 
one, you can print the maps, which contain your zones and your paths and your beacons, all in a nice printout showing your map and the locations of all information that you defined. And number two, if you have a high TVI retina display, the beam will display the maps beautifully and the text beautifully on these devices. And number three, reusability, you'll be able to cycle through your objects by repeatedly clicking on the same area instead of picking up the wrong object. And it does have MRU history list of files that you recently edited. And your Windows layout is persistent so that you don't have to keep redesigning your layout every time you come into the program. Okay, now we're ready to show you the Windows version of Beam. So we're going to first load a project and then show you how to use some of the capabilities and some of the new ones. You can go ahead and reopen an existing project, but we're going to just load a project from the directory. So I'm just going to load Office with many zones. I'm taking the map that uh, was shipped with Beacon Fence and I massaged it a little bit to add a few more zones. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to show you that you can add new maps, you can delete existing maps, and you can connect maps. Uh, right now in this form I have two maps. I have a main floor and a second floor. And switch between the two. I can also filter based upon the object types. Because quite often there's a lot of objects on your map and it gets kind of messy to try to edit them. So we allow you to view only the zones or view only the paths or view only the beacons. And then that allows you to fine tune and hone in on the part of the map that you want to work on. Now with these maps, you have to enter the, the zones. Rectangular zones are just drag and drop. And if you're on an iOS device, it'll just be your finger dragging and dropping and sizing the rectangle. You can also draw circles. And there's going to be properties on the right for each object that's currently selected. You can change the color, for instance, and change it like that. And you can also change it to a non-perfect circle if you want to be able to stretch it for ease of zone. But you also may use this most of it. The, uh, the polygonal zone for those non-rectangular rooms or areas that you wish to define. And that works the same way as it does in the internal editor. You click on the starting point, and then you start clicking repeatedly for each point you want to be part of the polygon. Here I'm drawing, and when I'm done, I just right-click on it. And if you're on a mobile space, you won't right-click on it since you don't have a mouse. You'll click on the arrow key, and that will finish the shape of the polygon. And you can move that around, with just dragging with the mouse. You can zoom in on the map by the mouse wheel. The map, mouse wheel. Um, you can also define beacons on here. It works the same way as it does in the internal editor. It shows you the point, and you can place them anywhere on the map, and repeatedly as well. And then you can also define the distance. Now this is important. Uh, some of the uh, webinars you might have seen the past for beacon fence. It's important to define your distance in the map early on before you start working with it. Otherwise, you're going to be scaled incorrectly. So scaling the map is one of the first things you should do. And that works just by clicking on two points on your map and then find the distance between those two points. And I'm going to leave it as is right now, but if you made it bigger or smaller, you would see your objects would no longer be relative to their current position on the bitmap. Another difference you may notice from the internal editor is the object properties window on the right. It's a lot more compact, it's column based, you can see a lot more information on the screen at once without having to scroll. You can also hide the object properties window if you want to maximize the map size in your working space. And similarly on the left hand side you can show the object tree. That can remain on the window as well and you can select objects through the object tree or to see what objects you actually have. And you can also select a different maps through the object tree. But that's also available on the main map menu, so you don't have to use the object tree to do that. It also allows you to define paths and path nodes so that you can give useful information to the developer about certain areas of the place that you're mapping. And for instance, if I click on one of these paths, I can actually extend the path. I add, click on the plus sign and now I can make the path longer. I can go up here, continue on. 
and then when I'm done, I click back on here. It means I'm done doing the maps. You can also decide that you want to connect two different nodes later on. So I can click on two different nodes here, and then I can connect them with this icon here, or disconnect them. Now, we're, this is more trying to get ready for a touch. That's why you'll see these kinds of menus, these pop-ups, that will show on mobile devices. And for more things, it lets you file print, which means it will print a what you see on the screen into a printout. And I think that's about all I'm going to show you for right now. We're going to move over to the iOS demo now. Okay, now I'm on my iPad. I'm going to go ahead and launch Beam. And when the first time you come in, you're going to be presented with a blank map. And in order to get around that, we'll have to click on the file options. And that's going to be located in the upper left-hand corner with a dot, dot, dot. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And there we'll see new project, load, share, and share as image. I'm going to go ahead and show you what each of those does, but first let me load a project. Load it from the sample maps. I'm going to load the same project that we were working on with Windows earlier, Office, Office with many zones. And now here is the project, and it looks exactly the same. Now let me continue with the file menu. A file menu, we can also share this map. I'm going to go back out. I can share it through an email. And then I will see an attachment of an XML file. An XML file can be sent to the email of your choice. I'm going to delete that. I can also share it to Google Drive. And then you'll see an attachment there. You can upload it to your Google Drive. Um, you can also share it as an image. If I share it as an image, then it will um, show me the ability to print as well and also the ability to send an email still. So as in the email, you'll see the images with it, um, that will be in the actual email. Okay, now let's move back to the to the form. Um, go the project. In. Oops, there you go. Back in the project, and this is a lot more slick to edit. If I move the finger around, it's going to move the map. If I use two fingers and pinch, it'll zoom and and shrink based on my finger movement, and the, similarly, if I click on an object, I'll click on this zone here, I can move this zone around, and then we'll follow the tracking of my finger. I can resize it by clicking on the handles, and make it bigger or smaller, and so on. We can also edit polygonal zones in the same way, but notice right now there's a lot of path nodes that are right around this polygonal zone, and I can move it around but there's a lot of paths that's right around there. So before trying to change the shape of it, I'm going to go ahead and slide from the left-hand side to bring up this multi-view that has some other options. It has the object tree, but also has the ability to change which nodes are viewable in the map. Right now it's showing Edit All. I'm going to click on that and select Edit Zones. And now my map will only show me the zones that are on this map. And then I'm going to click on the zone, and I'm going to go ahead and start changing the size of it now. Change it vertically by dragging that bottom point up and down. You can drag a point on the side and I go left and right. You can drag an actual point on the polygon and it will change the shape. So notice I'll go up and down and the shape is actually changing. And if you decide that you later on you made a mistake, you can click on the undo and go all the way back to where you started. I also like to show you another way to select objects easily, even if there's a lot of objects that are nearby. Let me go back and restore the edit all objects. And now notice the objects are pretty close, but I can actually select with my finger this area. And notice I got the wrong selection. I didn't get the polygon. But if I select again the same spot, it will cycle through all the objects in that area. Now this time you can see that it's selected polygonal zone. So now if I drag it around, it will move that particular object. So the idea is if you repeatedly click on the same spot, it will cycle through all the objects in that area. We haven't shown you the object properties display for the mobile environment. And that's accessed through sliding from the right or clicking on the dot 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 on the top top right. We click on that and now you'll see the properties for that object. And here I can change such things as description list. Then you can enter Note information about that particular zone, and this is accessible into your application, which if you want to query and get data about that zone, you may wish to use that in your application. 
You can also change the color like we did on the window side. You can change that to dark blue. And you can close it up by clicking on the map again. I'd like to show you now how to do multi-select on the mobile space. Since we don't have easy access to the keyboard, we need to find another way to do multi-select. The way Beam does that is it uses a long touch to add additional objects. So let me select the objects on the right hand side. There's three zones, all different colors. I'll select the top one here. I'm going to say it's selected. I'm going to select the second one below it and hold the mouse down. Now that's selected. I'm going to select the third one at the bottom and now I have three selected. Now if I drag the objects with my finger, it will drag all three objects as a unit. And you may wish to do that if you have things vertically aligned or horizontally aligned and you wish to keep them um, align so that you move them together. Now I'm going to show you a little bit about manipulating paths on the mobile space. We showed a little bit when we did it on the Windows side. Let me go ahead and do it on the mobile side. I'm going to go back to editing the paths and now it will show me just the path objects. I'm going to select an object like right there. I could extend the path by pushing a plus sign on the, that button and it will let me extend the path. And I'm going to go ahead and disconnect uh, a link between two nodes. I'm going to hold my finger down on the path right next to it. Now you see there's two path nodes selected. I'm going to disconnect them by clicking on the icon that doesn't have any lines. Now I notice that there is no connection between those two. Um, I can connect them as well by putting the connect button. Now they're reconnected as well. And then if I click this one node, I can actually extend the path by pushing the plus sign. And now whenever I put my finger, it's going to add new nodes to that until I said I'm done by clicking on the arrow key. I do want to mention how to open files on the mobile site. When we go back to load, what we did earlier is we loaded from the local, local files. But you can also load from the cloud. We have OneDrive and Dropbox. I click on OneDrive. It will bring up my OneDrive and I can go into the folders and select one of these files. Let's suppose I select Test Office Kitchen, open that up, and now I have um, a Test Office Kitchen. Let me go ahead and restore my edit all so I see everything on, on that project. But notice that there was a Google Drive on there, and there may be other cloud services that you're using that our product is not recognizing. The way to go around that is to go back into your, your Drive program. So I'm going to go back to my desktop. And notice that there's a drive icon here, which is Google Drive. Click on that. I can go into the Google Drive. I can open up folders on there. And here is a Beacon Maps folder. I can select one of these projects. I'm going to select Office 1. It'll open that up, but it doesn't know how to open it. So I'm going to say click Open In. And I'm going to slide over to Open In again. And now I can slide in. It'll show me um, Beacon Map Editor. I open that up. Now this is open, then you can actually manipulate this file that came from the cloud. Another reason you may wish to open your files in this fashion is for security reasons. You don't have to type in your account name and password, give access to your files in your cloud to the Beam application. In this fashion, you'll be able to keep the security separate and open your files with the actual native application, whether it be OneDrive, whether it be um, Drive from Google or Dropbox or whatever other cloud services that, you're, that you are using. So what does all this mean for the availability of Beam? We hope to have the Windows 10 version of by the end of March. It's currently in the Windows 10 application process for this more. And so is the iOS version. Um, we hope to have the iOS version ready by early April and the Android as well in early April. Android's not in the store process yet, but it has a much easier store approval process than the iOS version. In OS X, we hope to have that out in late April. If you wish to try out a product now before its release, you can contact me at RoyWall at gmail.com or email to sales at waterwall.net expressing your interest in trying out either the iOS or the Windows version right now. And uh, if you wish to order later on, you can use www.wallowall.com and go to our ordering page for our store. I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to listen to our announcement of Beam and to go over what features it has. And I'm excited. I hope you guys are excited as well. Now, if you have any questions, I would like to hear them.
Instead of being a... Okay, that was absolutely awesome, Roy. Hey, thank, um, thanks a lot. You know, I've seen a few kind of um, pretty cool applications coming out um, that have been written with FireMonkey, but um, I really like, uh, I, I kind of love the stuff that you've done with this. It's, uh, it's looking very, very cool. And uh, I believe you're, you're currently trying to get this into the, the Windows 10 store as well for, for getting out. Yeah, we actually got a, uh, we got it actually on the store as of last night. So if you guys are interested in just trying out um, just the pre-release version, um, you guys can try it out right now just by searching for either wall-to-wall -wall or or a beacon fence, and it should come up in the, in the search results. Okay, great. Well, that probably ties in nicely to Richard's question here, which is about how much does it cost? <laughs> ah, the product's going to be nine ninety nine, and that's going to include um, that's for each uh, user license, but the user license will will carry across the other devices as well. So if you have a license, then if you can do it for Windows or iOS or whatever other versions we have, it won't be an extra charge for the other devices. Okay, cool. Um, there's um, a question here from, from David as well. I am obviously a, a well-known component developer, and uh, in fact, you use, you've developed a huge number of really cool components in the past. Are you looking to move any of this into components that can be used in, and embedded into end users' applications at all? You mean, well, oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, well, BeaconFence is, is, is what we're using, so that already is in your programs when you're building um, this library. We're helping you build the data. So our user maps are really more for not going into your program. They're really for the map designer to give the data so that your programs can have accurate information. So yeah, I think the great thing about it being in the store is that if um, if I say I, I produced a, an application using Beacon Fence and I wanted my customers to be able to build the maps, uh, I can say, look, just go download this tool um, and you can do it. So um, yeah. yeah. It's actually, and also the if you look at the, um, you try it. You actually try it out. You're going to see that it's a lot more responsive to this video. This video doesn't really show much animation because of the the lag. But when you actually try it out, you're going to see what the excitement is all about. Cool. Um. Yeah. Just one um, one question I had is um, obviously yeah. It's the first time I've seen somebody opening up um, opening something up from Google Drive and launching it through to the application. Um, was that pretty straightforward and easy to do, or is that? Um, um, uh, that as far as I'm, you're part of the developers here, um, it was a struggle at first. But the main idea is you have to change your um, template manifest, manifest file on iOS and um, define your your type. And so it's really no coding involved. It's just basically. Just a few edits, um, like a, like a paragraph inside your uh, template that manifest file, and then and then iOS knows your program is able to recognize that type, and it will list it on the, on the list. So, if you guys are interested in knowing how to do that, I can I can show you the manifest file that we use, and you guys can do that on your own. Sounds like a great blog post sometime. Um, the um, the other question I had is obviously um, you know, being a component developer. Um, writing applications that you're kind of distributing out. Um, did you kind of um, learn any nice things along the way that um, uh, you kind of fed back into some of the components that you're doing? Because you're doing a whole host of components for five months. Now. <laughs> That's a yeah. great question, and the answer is a definite yes. We basically saw some of the needs that we really wanted, and even things like sharing. Um, I mean, there are share services built into Delphi, but only can not can share a bitmap and only share one file. So we wanted to share an XML file. We also wanted to share multiple bitmaps in the same email. So we just kind of enhanced that, and that'll be showing up in our Firepower product um, as well in our next version. And there's other things that we added. We added a color combo because that was needed in Beacon Fence as well to pick a color. So that will also be showing up in Firepower in our next version too. And there's a few other niceties that um, we added because of just kind of tweaks in terms of showing weight dialogues and changing messages, but those are more subtle and hard to describe, but yeah, definitely impacted um, our, our components week as we now kind of really kind of see um, some of the needs that we didn't see before. Okay, cool. Um, I think there's a, a suggestion for a future update here to, um, I don't know if this is something you kind of been thinking about, but uh, as, as Dave was saying, uh, it'd be really cool if you could just walk to where you want the um, 
uh, the boundaries to be and kind of touch the map and then walk off to the next point and then get it to actually um, map it in situ rather than uh, drawing it ahead of time. Maybe in terms of in terms of actually figuring out the distance by you walking, you mean? Yeah, so I, I guess to do that, you'd have to you'd have to load all the beacons into your application in the first place. What? Uh, and define them and then and then build what? it, and then that work would be done twice in some respects. I, I know that would be nice. I don't know how accurate it would be in terms of um, until you get all the data in there, at least the beacon data. But I mean, my thoughts also were about um, actually the map program. If you're using it like on an iPad walking around, it'd be nice to actually show your location as you're walking around. That's not in the current version, but that's something we can do because your iPad can be tracked, you know, you're entering the data. So that's something we might see down the road of you, the map designer is going to see his location with respect to all the objects that he's putting in. Yeah, I guess with the beacons there, uh, you know, beacon discovery can be um, run to kind of locate, well, find the beacons and then give you a list of them and you can then just place them onto the map. Yeah, so I think that would be ideal if you can do it simultaneously and see your location from yeah. from um, where you're at. So having to, you know, yeah, that's a great idea. Cool. Um, Christian, your your message just came through blank. So, um, oh no, it's hidden underneath. There was a an enter sign. Um, yeah, if you get a problem with the re uh, the audio at some point, you're on your end, Christian. Then um, uh, the replays will be made available. So um, this has is being recorded, so no worries about that. You'll get a, a link through from the Go to Webinar after the event. Uh, now, Alf had a question here about um, maximum distances with beacons. Um, yeah, beacons, um, it depends on the building, it depends on what's in their way for how far they can transmit, it depends on the beacon as well. Uh, it depends on the, the power setup that you've got set on the beacon. You know, some beacons run just off a of battery, some of them plugged into mains. Um, and depends on how regularly they're transmitting as well, because the rest, the less frequently they transmit, the longer the battery will last, and so on. So, um, it really does depend um, on a number of different factors about how far the beacon's going to work uh, and how many you're going to need inside, um, uh, which is uh, is one of those things. Just uh, get a whole load, give them a try, and uh, and see what works for you in your different area. Mm. Okay. Uh, Another message here, looks great, love the multi-device version, which is, uh, yeah, that's that's pretty nice. Uh, I must admit, I kind of, um, I, I've got some mind mapping software that I use, and having the ability to sync stuff between my my Mac and my iPad um, is a huge plus for me uh, in terms of working, and um, you know, having, the, having the multi-device stuff and being able to share files and so on is, is, a, is a very, very cool feature. Yeah, I think that was it's also necessary. If you don't have the ability to share, then what good is a mobile device? Um, so it's it was important yeah. to be able to work out those technologies. <laughs> but this is all. It's not cool that you know FireMonkey can do all this kind of stuff, and your application that you're running is is very optimal and fast, and 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 as my brother would say, it's very buttery, just the way it feels and and the, and the touching and moving things around. Yeah. Um, right, slightly long question come through here, so I'm just trying to <laughs> quickly skim over it. Um, something about um, oh, is um, yeah, something to do with the you know, office spaces quite often change layouts, desks get moved around, and so on. Um, so being able to re-edit um, the bitmap of the office um, is kind of a, a would be useful. Um, you mean within the application? Yeah. No, I I mean, the, that's just that any, you know, there's already programs out there that can edit bitmaps or paint. I mean, yeah. maybe with a way to launch the editor from the app would be nice, but uh, um, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, we want to spend all our resources on creating a bitmap editor. But Yeah. But definitely something to consider down the road if you know if enough people want it. Oh, yeah, and uh, already you're getting some excitement from people asking and uh, looking forward to seeing what term um, comes next for Beam as uh, 
Uh, so uh, it sounds like you're going to have to get uh, get your roadmap published for this at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. Well, we've been, you know madly getting this ready for release uh, and working through all the hurdles of getting into the stores and. It's nice to be able to get on the Windows 10 store and, and with a straight FireMonkey like application, and, and I think Marco can too. Had described the steps, and they they work. You know, it's in the store right now, and it's approved, and you can download it. Yeah, and get, just kind of a, I think the comment was just being clarified. Everyone asking for a bitmap editor, they're just reinforcing the. You know, it's really cool that it's a non-bitmap based editor for for doing work. So. Okay. Cool. Great. Well, um, I say really, really interesting uh, presentation. Um, I'm, I'm, I kind of really, uh, really hope it kind of goes really, really well for you with this. And uh, certainly, uh, so keep an eye out for for what is going to come on uh, from this. If you want to see this webinar again, um, we're going to be online uh, probably about four and a half hours, I think it is from now, um, for a rerun of this. So if you have got questions that kind of appear in the meantime, feel like you can come back and, and ask them again uh, later on if you want to get a, a direct answer from uh, Roy. Well, his email's on the screen at the moment, so just drop him an email over. Um, yeah, again, I, I've, I've used uh, Roy's components for many, many years. I had a whole stack of them back in Delphi 5, which uh, <laughs> made our application look very modern at the time. With some pretty cool sideways labels and so on. So, um, uh, you know, great, great quality components and uh, uh, definitely uh, worth popping over to his, his website and having a look at the, the kind of cool stuff that he's got there, not only for um, for BCL but also for for FireMonkey and um, uh, and kind of keep in touch in terms of things that you see and you want for beacon uh, for beacon fencing. Now, obviously, if you are interested in beacon fencing itself. Um, then feel free to get hold of uh, one of the sales reps at Embarcadero. Um, Beacon Fencing is part of uh, the uh, RAS, RAS server and um, at the moment we're running a promotion where you can get a free site license of RAS server um, with, uh, with some of the upgrades So um, and also an, uh, a few additional months uh, maintenance uh, Plus, I think it's about 10-15% off on Architect as well. So um, there's some really good deals on the Rad Offer page, which will allow you to get easily um, kind of uh, Rad Server and also Beacon Fence uh, and be able to take advantage of this um, with this great product um, straight away. So great. Um, I don't see any more questions coming through. Anything you want to finish off with, Roy? No, oh, just so I'm, look, I'm looking forward to the future, and I, I really encourage you guys to to try it out and just just download it and play with it. But, and thank you so much, Stephen, for you know taking the time to answer the questions too. You're welcome. Um, see you online in a few hours. Thanks okay. very much, everyone. Happy coding. Take care. All right. Goodbye.